Thank you very much. That's uh, quite the introduction. Um, so I work uh, with cancer patients, and uh, so, and I'm seeing and I'm hearing your stories, and I realize that there must be a huge gap between what patients want and speak with their physicians and what we are able to deliver. And, and that's maybe the core of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so I was going to actually start with a patient story, and just one of my own patients and their own experience with medical marijuana use and, and uh, cancer treatment, and just some of the, and how this highlights all the issues that you guys have been talking about. So this is an 82-year-old gentleman with an esophageal cancer, uh, and uh, he's been very sick for a long time, and he's having difficulties eating, chewing, swallowing. The tumor is starting to block off his esophagus. He can't eat. Uh, and so he comes to us, and, and there's this, you know, strange symptoms that we're noticing. Uh, he's starting to have sweats, fevers. He's shaking. He's lost his appetite. And so we didn't know what was going on. We admitted him to hospital, and we were very concerned. Oh, maybe the tumor is starting to uh, push into the, the chest, or is it blocking his esophagus, or is it perforating because he had these high temperatures. And we had done all sorts of tests, and we weren't able to figure out what was going on with him. And then about three days into the admission, his wife very quietly you know, mentioned, oh, by the way, he's been taking medical marijuana oil, uh, and he couldn't take it anymore for the last three days because he couldn't swallow, and he was here in the hospital. And so we realized that many of his symptoms were in fact withdrawal from his medications, and we restarted his medications, and he got better. So it, it highlights there's a lot going on that we don't know and what we don't understand and what communication gaps are between patients patients and families. And so I thought this highlights so many p pieces of what's going on in the community with the, this rapid legalization and the lack of the data. So one was that in my practice, patients, um, the average age of my patients is 70. So that's a very different population than, say, most people here in the panel, you know, younger pay people. So we have to recognize 70-year-olds is the average age. I mean, that means 80s and 90-year-olds or, you know, flanking either side of that average. So recognizing the patient population or age might really play into how medical marijuana might be used in cancer patients. One, the other is that 50% of my patients are palliative, which means that we're taking care of complex pain or symptoms or other symptoms uh, in a setting that they are now uh, you know, the cancer is not going to go away. So that's a huge chunk of what we do, and that's very different than, uh, say, in what we call an adjuvant therapy, where patients are being cured of their cancer and they will live the remainder of their lives cancer-free. So again, different kinds of needs in different kinds of patients. So recognizing this patient is a palliative patient, his symptoms might go on for the remainder of his life, and how can we best optimize his care? Uh, so the other thing I noticed is that there's been a lot of discussion around vaping. And what I've noticed and amongst my patients is that almost every single one uses oil. So that was a very different experience. And so patients use oral oils. And I think it's because the age of the patients they're not used to vaping, they're not used to smoking, there's not that traditional habit. And when I see my 40-year-old cancer patients come in and they said, oh yeah, we already smoke at home and can we, can we vape and can you help me do this? Um, very different discussions are happening. So reflecting on the nature of our patients and making sure we're able to meet their needs. So, and the other thing that I noticed is that our patients are often using cannabis or medical marijuana without thinking about it as a medication. They, they, they've been taking it for a while, they may not treat it, and that really highlights what uh, uh, the prior speaker said is in regards to that medication or medica uh, how, do, how patients treat them differently. You know, what is being used as a therapeutic agent versus a medication which is prescribed. Uh, so we as healthcare providers may not even know to ask our patients, are you using something? Are, we ask patients about alcohol use. We don't necessarily, you know, IV drug use, we ask about it. But we may or may not even ask about medical marijuana use. Patients might be scared to mention to their doctor that they're on something. And that's added or you know, something that we do need to take into account when we are reflecting the kinds of care and needs for our patients. So I felt that this simple little story really highlighted so many pieces of what's going on right now. Um, so to move, how do we help this? How do we work on this? And so one of the things that I've been working with my students and teaching, uh, again, part of patient education is that 
we're here to meet the patient's needs. So, so very often when you get really busy in a healthcare practice, you, your job is to meet the healthcare system needs, which is say in a busy family practice, we have 70 patients, we have to see all of them. We don't have time to talk to everyone, or we need to get through with this to get onto the next procedure. So very often physicians are acting out of habit to meet healthcare systems needs and not meeting the patient's needs. And we're hearing very clearly is that they, patients want to, want to be heard. They want to be understood. They want to be, feel like a partnership. And, I, and we have to reinforce that even as years of practice. Sometimes I forget and you get right into it. So really, and I think medical care, cannabis use may really help us bridge that and sort of force patients and physicians to have that really good conversation. We have to learn in oncology that we have to treat patients, not their diseases. Uh, again, very often we start focusing on, well, you've got esophageal cancer, this is what you've got to do, instead of what are the patient's needs? This patient's really worried about not being able to eat and swallow. He's feeling tired and weak and sick. We're focused on, okay, what treatment needs to be done and what this and this and this, and so we're not listening to the patients. And so when that happens, we start seeing problems. Um, so again, we had to really make sure we, we talk about this. And so what I've taken as an approach is recognizing my lack of knowledge and said I am not an expert of medical marijuana. And so that's, I'm an expert of cancer therapy. And how do I bring this in now? We, we, you know, the prior speaker really spoke to the limitations of knowledge. Uh, and so what I feel like I do a lot is talking about my openness and what I don't know. And that has led to an openness in communication with my patients. And, uh, and then they're, they're willing to ask questions. They're willing to reveal, you know, that this is going on in their lives and this is a problem and these are the real challenges and then you can actually address them. So patient-centered care is a key theme which I think is gonna resonate in delivering medical care cannabis use for patients. One of the things that I, I feel is, and, and I think you guys are very much representing that, this is a drug or like and unlike any other drugs that we're used to using as physicians. Uh, so when it comes to me prescribing an anti-nauseant for chemotherapy or a, an opioid for pain, I have a very clear sense of the, the way I give the drug. And we're very physician-centered when we do this. You'll notice that your physician, when he gives you a prescription for an opioid, will be take this many drugs, this dose at this time, five times or six times a day, and take a breakthrough in between. We're very prescriptive in how we give a prescription. We are, and it, that is a physician-centered approach to medical care. And what I'm finding, uh, that that approach isn't what we need or is not even how this drug works. Medical marijuana doesn't seem to work that way Patient's use isn't that way. We need to learn how patients use the drug. Uh, and so it's a drug that's like and unlike other drugs. It's got, and as we showed that complicated chart of organic mixes, you know, I feel uncomfortable when I see that mix. When I look at the chemical composition of an anti-nauseant, I know exactly what I'm giving my patient. I can see the 100-page list of side effects that, we, that it causes, and at least I know what side effects I'm going to expect. Or at least I know what I'm getting when I deliver a specific dose. Uh, I feel uncomfortable. And when people feel uncomfortable about something, they are cautious. They're worried. And so even as physicians, educated people, we are cautious to jump in and offer this medication because we, we are uncertain. So I, that's a feeling that I get when I look at this complexity. And so I have to step back and say, well, what did my patient experience? And what did they use it for? And how did they use it? And so because we are moving to this model where physicians may not be the sole owners and controllers of all the information and, and handing out wisdom from upon high. We are now becoming partners with our patients to how can we collaborate with them to make sure they manage their health as best as possible. And that's what I feel like my medical marijuana talks are with my patients, is that what, what do you think you're gonna benefit from this? How do, what do you know? What do you understand? Okay, what do I know? What do I don't know? This is a little bit of advice. I'm holding your hand and walking down this path with you, and we don't know where we're gonna go. Um, and, and that's, I feel, is a very big change in the way that physicians, and in particularly in oncology, work. Um, I, I'm one, probably one of the, leaders, I'm looking through a very small hole through my 
my window of ice and I'm driving as carefully as I can, but many of my colleagues are still very reluctant. And so I do see that if you're a patient in the cancer community, many of the physicians might shut down or they don't know or they're concerned or worried and so they, they're not forming this partnership. And I think that's a big piece of education which hopefully symposiums like this and people openness will lead, especially in the, in the oncology community. So I, I think this is really very promising and that's where I'm going to end. You know, I always feel that hopefulness is the key element of what I deliver in oncology and I feel there's great promise uh, in use of uh, medical cannabis in my patient population and, and really in particularly I, I found two or three areas which I think is, I've seen very useful patient feedback and still waiting for clinical trials is an appetite symptom management, patients who've lost their appetite, they can't eat, they're nauseous, they're vomiting uh, on chemotherapy or radiation or because of their cancer. So this is a, a group of patients who I've very consistently heard back on that this is something very effective. Um, and I, I would say for mild to moderate cancer pain. So, so I have seen this pattern and that, you know what, as an adjunct to appropriate symptom management from mild to moderate cancer pain, I am seeing benefits, and I think that's a consistent uh, thing that we are seeing from almost all pain patients, but that doesn't mean every patient has good pain relief. Uh, but uh, I am saying that, I'm saying that this is areas of promise, and I think I'm very hopeful that we will be able to expand our knowledge and understanding in this. With that, I come with some cautions uh, in that one, we have to recognize the, the frailty and elderly nature of many of our sick cancer patients that I'm dealing with. Like I said, 50% of my patients average survival is about a year. So that's a very different age and old, sick population. And so me, that's a subgroup which we need to be very careful in and when we're using our medications, any medication. Uh, so this, I treat this just like any other. So we have to be careful, we have to understand the interactions. Uh, one thing that I've really noticed is that when patients' symptoms aren't well managed, when you have a patient with cancer pain and their symptoms are inappropriately managed, in inadequately managed, patients will turn to other alternatives. They will feel desperate, they will feel a loss, a loss uh, and their, their physicians aren't supporting them. And I, feel, I see this a lot. Unfortunately, uh, in our practice, just the, the nature of what's happening, the way the healthcare systems are working, patients have inadequately managed symptoms. But that doesn't mean we can't manage symptoms, and there, there aren't really good ways to manage certain symptoms. Certain type of chemotherapy-related nausea is extremely well managed with certain drugs, and we just have to manage them. So I feel like the medical marijuana talk shouldn't divert us from delivering the appropriate care. And sometimes nausea vomiting has nothing to do with the chemo drugs. It might be due to bowel blockage. So we have to make sure we're listening to our patients and looking for other problems as well. So, but I've noticed this pattern of inadequately managed symptoms and leading patients to seek alternatives. Uh, and the other key thing, which I think is still very cautionary, many of my patients use medical marijuana for cancer therapy. Uh, and right now, I feel it's, I'm reluctant or unable to provide really good advice as, can I say that I have good evidence to support this as an anti-cancer treatment? I feel comfortable using it carefully for the use of symptom management, but I'm very worried about patients using this instead of established cancer therapies or, um, or not coordinating what we do. So that's one thing that I'm finding this openness. We have to discover patients are doing a lot of different things on their own. They're using all, many different non-standard Western therapies and we have to understand what they are and how they interact. Um, but right now I can't with good confidence say this and I'd be worried as a physician would I be under medical scrutiny from the college if I were to prescribe it for this purpose. And so there is this careful discussion that, you know, yes, I understand you're taking it, I understand that you're not taking any radiation or chemotherapy right now, we will monitor, but I can't implicitly say, yes, I think this is going to treat your cancer. And so I don't want to project this in, because I don't know yet. I've seen lots of patients, and I'll, we can go on lots of questions about this, but I've seen lots of patients who use cannabis with very terrible cancers and control their cancer for a long time, but eventually, almost every patient I've seen, those cases the cancer eventually does start growing again. So did it work, how much it worked, that still really needs to be well quantified, and I'm cautious to just recommend it. But uh, thank you very much, this was excellent. Questions?